Hello, everyone, and welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Joan Lima, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for tuning to our latest virtual CEO roundtable. Our first 100 registrants for today's roundtable will have received a fresh lunch delivered to your door or a gift card to order your own meal. And today, we are excited to share our JSA virtual roundtables on a new platform to include the first in the industry virtual networking experience with a unique opportunity to talk face to face with other event attendees before and after the panel. So make sure you head back to the networking lounge after the discussion for live networking with speakers and attendees of today's event. As a quick reminder for everyone who has joined us today, we look forward to your participation during this event. So please feel free to add any questions that you may have into the chats or request the mic to come on camera and ask your question to our panelists directly. If you have any questions about upcoming roundtables, whatever it may be, such as how to register or how to participate, feel free to reach out to us through our website at jsa.net. And by the way, just as a reminder to mark your calendars, our next virtual roundtable will cover edge data centers, critical low latency solutions for big cities, and that will take place on July the 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Without further delays, let's get started. Our topic for today, we will be covering disaster recovery and network resiliency. Um, downtime, as you all might know, can translate to substantial losses, making disaster recovery plans critical for business continuity. Uh, with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our exceptional executive lineup who are waiting on the, our topic. And joining us today, we have Jill Santillis, CEO of NJFX, Paul Scott, CEO of Confluence Networks, Isaac Mian, VP of Sales and Support Engineering at Red Light Communications, Warren Rayburn, SVP of Sales and Marketing at Comstar Technologies, and Sean Forney, Director of Data Center Marketing at Cola. Um, I mean, first, I apologize if I butched anyone's name, but let's go around in the, the room and get you guys to introduce, um, instead of me talking about you for a while. Uh, let's go around and you guys introduce yourselves and what you do, what business you're in, if it's networking, if it's data center. Um, let us know what you do and where you come from. Um, who wants to go first? Otherwise, I'll just pick someone. <laughs> I oh, yeah, so I, yeah, I can go first. Isaac Mia, Redline Communications, um, a Canadian manufacturer of um, hardened uh, wireless networking solutions uh, for the mission critical industries. And right now, I'm here in Toronto under a complete lockdown. Still in full lockdown. <laughs> yeah. um, Warren, would you like to go next? Yeah, absolutely. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Warren Rayburn. Uh, I serve as the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Comstar Technologies. Uh, we are on the network side of the equation for today's uh, conversation. We are a full service voice and data integration partner for our clients. Uh, our services range from IT and MSP uh, to UCAS and also inclusive of audiovisual and phys physical security needs. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Um, Jill? Sure. Thank you for having me, Jao, first of all, and thank you to the JSA team for being allowing NGFX to be part of this session today. So Gil Santelis, I'm the founder and the CEO of NGFX, and we're a carrier neutral cable landing station. Uh, we've got four subsea cables that land on our campus. Campus is comprised of two facility, an original facility back built in 2001 by Tyco, bought by Tata Communications with two subsea cable systems, TGNA and B, as well as the CBRAS cable. We've got a meet me room in that facility. Then we built a tier three cable landing station next door where we host the Hafru cable that has uh, capacity and fibers going to Denmark, Norway, and Ireland. We're an interconnection hub. So we're a data center facility tier three, but really facilitate communications between subsea cables terrestrial systems, creating an ecosystem for dynamic telecommunications. Hmm. Which has been so important over the last 14 months, especially. Um, Sean, would you like to go next? Sure, thanks. Hey, everyone, Sean Farney. Uh, I'm the Director of Data Center Marketing at Kohler. We've actually been making power gear for over 100 years, uh, including uh, more recently our four megawatt gen set. Uh, and before that, I built and ran data centers for Microsoft. And uh, coming to you today live from the wilds of uh, rural Wisconsin outside of Milwaukee. Thank you. Uh, and Paul, last but not the least. Thank you, Joe. And an extended thanks to all the, J to all the JSA team for this opportunity. 
I'm the CEO and co-founder of Confluence Networks, which is a subsidiary of MazTech, a New York Stock Exchange player in the infrastructure space. And we're developing the first of its kind offshore Eastern Seaboard subsea, highly scalable network platform that is meant to provide unmatched diversity for Eastern Seaboard North-South traffic to provide a step change in resiliency and performance and security for uh, users of uh, high bandwidth applications. So we'll, uh, we'll connect data centers, carrier to carrier, dozens of international subsea links that currently converge on the Eastern Seaboard into the domestic fabric. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be co-locating with my friend Gil up there at uh, New Jersey Fiber Exchange as uh, part of that uh, expanded ecosystem. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I thought before we dive into the more in-depth questions, maybe let's just establish the difference between resilience and recovery. Um, so who wants to explain the difference to our audience between resilience and recovery? I'll take a stab at, at the first yep. shot. So from my definition, resiliency means I'm not going to have to recover, right? So if I do a good enough job in building a system that's resilient, my customer won't feel any kind of issue for a quote unquote recovery. And I'm talking from perspective of a facility providing power, cooling, and interconnection services physically to connect these networks together. It's all in the planning. We call it blue sky planning. So if you build it right and you prepare and you have methods of procedures, when you do any kind of changes, you really are providing a resilience where you don't have to have a recovery. Hmm. No, I think it makes absolute sense. Anyone would like to add anything else, Isaac? Um, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll just build on that. Resilience is, uh, you know, uh, from my perspective, um, uh, it, uh, avoid failure avoidance. Um, and then recovery is, okay, what do you do? How soon can you recover uh, once you have failure? Because uh, let's not forget that, uh, you know, uh, Murphy uh, uh, does exist. Uh, hmm. You know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Even if it cannot go wrong, it will still go wrong. <laughs> so, you know, failure is going to happen no matter what, no matter how resilient the system is. Um, uh, so then it, it, it all becomes about, uh, you know, how soon are you going to recover? from that failure what is at risk um, uh, you know what's the cost of a failure and uh, you know uh, as the failure duration uh, increases you know that cost increases so how can you minimize that um, you know i come uh, primarily from an electricity infrastructure industry and in 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 that uh, industry and in canada if you if there is an electricity outage in the dead of winter uh, it's not just about money it's about people's lives at risk hmm. um, uh, so recovery becomes very um, important at that point uh, you know it, it can mean different things for different industries uh, but the key difference between the two is resilience first you try your best you design your system you operate your system to make sure there is no failure uh, but then recognizing that failure is going to happen eventually uh, and that you are prepared uh, to recover from that failure in the networking world, we use the terms like, you know, MTBF, mean time between failure, um, and then MTTR, mean time yeah. to resolution. You know, these are kind of the metrics that are used. Yes, and we'll be touching on those soon as well. I think, Sean, would you like to add? Yeah, thanks. In the data center space, um, it, it comes down to plan and design, as already mentioned. So it, it, as far as resilience is concerned, basis of design, that phase of designing your build is, is really where you address resiliency, right? So do you have parallel electrical and mechanical infrastructure? Do you build for concurrent uh, maintainability? Those types of things. So uh, you don't have, as others have mentioned, you don't you don't have an interruption of, of uptime. Um, but you also do have to address recovery. Uh, um, if there is an outage, what do you do and how? And you have to practice that and you have to train to train to that. So service providers obviously have to have both. Um, they want to avoid 
uh, downtime. Otherwise, they're, they're, they're remunerating customers many times due to contractual obligations. But if there is an issue and a problem, you do have to know what to do and you have to practice that. And usually that's that's audit driven. Um, when I was at Microsoft, hmm. we had to have both and we had to test um, at regular intervals um, the, the, the what if scenarios. Hmm. Okay, well, that makes sense. And let's talk about when things go wrong and paint a picture on why this is all very important. Um, I mean, how bad can things get? I think, Isaac, you kind of already touched uh, the, the point here, uh, almost between life and death. But how bad can things get, um, even on a business level? We used to have those reports from, I think, it was um, Ericsson in the old days or something like that, where the cost of downtime on the data center space was huge. I mean, every minute, every hour was a fortune. Um, they'll be thrown out of the window. And then the latest one we had was from 2014, something like that. So now these will be a lot. How bad can things get? Uh, I, To be honest, I don't think there's a limit to that. You know, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, the, the British uh, petroleum oil spill that happened, um, you know, uh, it was it was a failure of that infrastructure. And uh, the cost of that still continues. If you look at the complete cost, you know, it's in hundreds of billions of dollars and, and it still hasn't ended. The environmental cost of it, uh, the communities are still dealing with it. If you look at, um, you know, um, again, I come from a mission critical infrastructure industry, so I'll give you those examples. If you look at the electricity infrastructure, uh, you know, the, the most, um, sort of prominent blackout that I remember is 2003 uh, blackout, um, you know, and I think all of us here are old enough to remember that uh, in, in, in the northeast, uh, northeastern part of this continent. Uh, the cost of that, um, um, you know, blackout, uh, that outage, if I remember correctly, was estimated at somewhere between six to nine billion dollars to the economy. <coughs> Uh, you know that's the that's how bad it can get. Um, and as I mentioned, you know the the um, if this happens in in the dead of winter, uh, in, in a place like Canada or in North Dakota and and these places, uh, you know you're talking about human lives hmm. at that stage. Yeah. And I guess I that's add, more, uh, yeah. I might add that uh, we all recall the Christmas Day Nashville uh, bombing event uh, that. Uh, took out a central office for an extended period, uh, an example of where what appears on its face to be resilient, multi-path environments where networks should be up, uh, things happen. And what we're hearing and part of our case logic to build this subsea link up the East Coast is we, we really, this is coming from big enterprise, carriers, service providers, is we really need to think about improving our diversity. It's one thing to have four or five multi-path fiber routes into your core data center, but with cloud adoption growing at an alarming rate mm -hmm. higher, with the move from on-prem to spinning up virtual servers in a distant environment, you know, the best ability is availability. And it starts with, and we beat this to death, uh, uh, feeling good about your net core network architecture so that when events happen, there's a, a decent chance your uptime remains uh, in your in your in your server environment is is available, but when it fails, uh, you need your disaster recovery plans, and they need to be vetted, tested. Uh, whether that's cycling generators or working with uh, the teams, and what what if we face a real challenge? What is our action plan to to tighten that meantime the recovery? Hmm. Um and I mean, I really think this is a really topical subject because with everything that's been going on over the last fourteen months. Um, there's a lot of companies jumping into cloud and adopting a lot of digital strategies. And maybe sometimes it's actually a topic that gets um, thrown into second plan. And then when they hit with something bad, things don't go according to plan um, as part of what it, this is about. But um, so speaking about then, for those that don't know, like how often should a business uh, test their environment and what is the process like to test a business system? Yeah, I'll jump in there from from our perspective, uh, Joe, what we assist clients with is developing those business continuity plans. Um, and as part of that uh, uh, interaction, you know, we outline, you know, their uptime targets, those targets also that they uh, to their, clients, their service level agreements outward facing and otherwise, um, you know, a lot of it 
for us, you know, it, it goes right back to that design consideration. You know, it's it's that mantra of, of just really not if, but when. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in preparation for today's dialogue, I was reading up on a few studies, and one interesting one referenced a, a survey of 500 global IT leaders, and uh, half of those surveyed stated that they've had outages that lasted 30 minutes or more, uh, mm -hmm. at least four times through the year of 2020. And given the reliance on the cloud architecture and the security considerations and otherwise uh, that, that this pandemic thrust upon the market, you know, it it, uh, it certainly gave people pause. And I think, you know, in terms of these BCP business continuity plans and initiatives, push them to the forefront of their thought process. So it's, uh, you know, it does come down to the testing aspect of it. You know, depending on the business, there's compliance considerations, uh, arguably, um, you know, but best practices, you know, again, from a quarterly standpoint, we, we start often there. Uh, but, you know, for us, it's a matter of defining the people, their responsibilities, uh, the testing elements all the way through from the edge and the hardware consideration up through and including their connectivity to those cloud elements, uh, avoiding overlap and otherwise, and to make sure we have that resiliency accounted for. Hmm. Okay. Jill, yeah. would you like to add something? I, I would. If you think about disasters, we're still in a disaster. Right, we, we we have our employees that aren't in office buildings. We're asking traders to trade from home. Um, I don't know if there was ever a game plan for this to tell the entire world to go home and not go where the big pipes existed in those office buildings. We had to have data centers repurpose their data and access the internet, and the internet became mission critical. This thing that evolved in the last fifteen years called the internet is what kept us all coordinated, connected, and how it works today. We wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for the quality of the internet. What makes me nervous, and Paul touched upon this, you know, there was a quiet Christmas day that just went by where one building in the middle of America had a problem by one individual and four states lost the internet for a couple of days. That, that makes you think, like, how vulnerable really are we? So, we have to be responsible as a community when it comes to being telecommunication leaders to make sure that we point out issues where we see the evolved internet not finding itself having pinch points and all of a sudden one failure at one building built in 1920 creates a catastrophic effect for an entire region potentially globally and that comes down to planning your infrastructure putting things in place that always work no matter what happens. We can lose a downtown environment. We can lose an older building. Um, let's put assets in purpose-built facilities, not older buildings that have underground parking in them that can be very susceptible. So going forward, the internet is no longer a nice to have for video games and doing your homework and, and looking at websites. No, it's how we're going to be communicating for the foreseeable future. And we need to make sure that as leaders in the industry, we're making the right investments to make sure this always works. Things like the cloud don't work without the internet. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a great, great point, Gil. Within a matter of weeks, we found ourselves in a global business continuity exercise, right? That's been going on now for more than a year, um, which is just amazing. So back to the, the, the question around how much should you test and for what you should test your recovery plans, uh, more testing, and for things we haven't even thought about. Um, look at a couple of few months ago down in Texas, what happened. Um, just due to a failure of imagination in the design of the electrical grid, the lights went out. And talk about mission critical, not to be morbid, you know, th that's when people's lives were involved, right? Um, everyone rolled over to generators, you know, knock on wood, thank goodness for, for generators. They kept data centers up, they kept hospitals up, they kept healthcare and emergency response up, but no one even thought that could happen and certainly no one thought this pandemic should happen. So for, for, for the crowd today, test often, often test randomly. It, it might be tough. we had audit intervals for testing our, our disaster recovery plans, but we also had random tests. You'd get a phone call to do a tabletop exercise. Imagine this just happened, how would you react? So the industry needs to embrace that because we are now living it it's it's a it's a different, uh, brave new world, and um, we need to accommodate that and update our plans for sure. Whether that's you know bits on the wire and um, 
how uh, B, BGP talks to to each uh, to, to other zones across uh, network connections, or how you build data centers and how many generators and parallel infrastructure systems you put in. Um, things are much different now. Yeah, uh, and I mean, especially with the advent of edge computing as well, this is going to be even more important, um, especially around building proposed built infrastructure um, to cope with our digital lives. Um, and I mean, if it wasn't for this industry, we were saying just before we came on on, on um, came live, we were saying how how well this industry has actually managed to do during COVID. Um, and I mean, you can just imagine what the world would have been like if this industry wasn't here, um, like it wasn't a hundred years ago with the Spanish flu. So it would have been a lot worse. So. I mean, the industry does deserve a round of applause. Um, and I really like the point of we need to build purpose-built infrastructure um, to cope with today's world, not the world of 30 years time, and not one building that throws down a few states or even the world's internet down. Um, but speaking of throwing a few states down offline and like even the world, um, I mean, how should business respond in the time of crisis? We are in a time of crisis. We've kind of touched upon that. Um, but even beyond the global pandemic, I mean, a hurricane, we, we had uh, the big freeze um, I think it was down in Texas a few weeks ago, a few months ago. Um, I hope I got the right state. Um, I mean, we've also have data center fires. We have a massive fire in a data center here in Europe um, a few weeks ago, which made headlines everywhere. Um, I mean, how should businesses respond in times of crisis? Um, Isaac? Um, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, first things first. If um, if you haven't thought it through, if a business hasn't thought it through, uh, and they've just started uh, thinking about how to respond to a crisis, it's already too late. You know, I'd say just let it be. Um, you know, um, it, you have to be prepared, and we've already discussed this. Uh, you know, you have to do your regular uh, regulatory, uh, your regular tests and everything. Um, you know, you have to plan it out. Uh, you know, that from my perspective is the very first step you have to understand today and it's not just about the past um, or even the present the pandemic we're in it's the future that we are stepping into you know everyone in in these industries uh, today is talking about the fourth industrial revolution and the digital transformation and all these things you know the one thing and and it's good it's good for innovation and it's good for uh, you know economic development globally it's going to be great um, okay but that great achievement comes with certain risks um, today uh, the the it, we're integrating uh, information and communication technology with uh, a sort of uh, uh, you know the traditional industrial system, um, and that is creating interdependencies um, that um, and and complexities that we don't understand yet. You know, I have a doctorate in the field. I'll tell you, I don't fully understand when it comes to integrating ICT with the energy infrastructure. And if anyone out there is is claiming that they understand all the interdependencies that are being created, you know, as we integrate ICT with the power system, you know, I say they're lying. OK, so that is the first thing we need to acknowledge that as as we as we digitally transform our infrastructures, we are creating complexities that we don't yet fully understand, which means that eventually a failure is going to happen. So we need to thought it through in advance how we are going to react to these failures. You know, and that then depends on the industry and the business you're in. You know, for something like a, a nuclear power plant, for example, that response is going to be very complex. Even testing that response, uh, you know, uh, will put the system at risk itself. You know, mm. so so you have to be very careful, and that strategy, that testing strategy, uh, you know, has to be worked through. Uh, a, you know, usually you won't do it more than one than once a year. Um, but the the key sort of the uh, key focus at both ends at a very high level, and I'll sum it up, is one is recognizing that we are creating interdependencies that we don't fully understand yet. Yet, so there is a risk out there that needs to be managed. And two, once it happens, once there is a crisis, we should have prepared for it, we should be prepared for it, and then the focus should be on reducing the duration of that crisis. How fast can I recover? 
you know, and then how can I leverage the tools, the technologies, the people, the processes to, to optimize all of these in alignment with each other to mm -hmm. recover as quickly from the crisis at poss as possible. And I'll probably add as well on the marketing front, it's important to be very open and honest uh, with clients and consumers uh, and keep them aware of what's going on. Uh, Warren, what would, would you like to add? Yeah, I think that's a big key. Uh, we, we have ourselves found uh, so much success and, and, you know, in terms of our partnerships with our clients and, and expanding those partnerships and providing true value uh, to their business. I mean, you, you look at the impact that this pandemic had on the small business community uh, and, you know, you, you find yourself often challenging, you know, the, the or being met with the challenge around budget. And, you know, you, you have to be prepared to speak to, you know, what a lack of a plan and, and readiness on the execution front could lead to uh, for the business. I, I think the key is, is interrogating, you know, the existing environment at all times. Uh, you know, we've touched on the testing and the preparation and the planning, but I would only add that, you know, we, we have found many, many occasions where there are assumptions made, uh, you know, poor pre-sales preparation, you know, from an incumbent provider, for example, whereby, you know, there's two different names on the internet uh, or two different invoices to service the client's internet needs. Uh, but then we come to expose the fact that there's overlap uh, in the plant route, uh, you know, shared fiber, for example, you know, and wholesale relationships and otherwise. So those, those things, you know, I think we own the responsibility as a service provider to expose those items uh, to the benefit of our clients. And uh, again, take it, as I said earlier, from every step of the way, from the endpoint through the client edge, carrier edge, and out into the uh, you know the PSTN and beyond uh, to the internet. So that's uh, interrogate is is my is my keyword there. Warren, a question from me to you. Uh, you know, as I think back of penetration testing and, and these things, uh, you know, easy for the CFO to say, do we really need that? That seems like an unnecessary spend. I I have no idea if the Colonial Pipeline performed a robust, rigid. Uh, uh, array of, uh, of protective uh, cloaking, like, like penetration tests to find those vulnerabilities, to find, you know, when I think of my fiber world, it's one thing to have six fiber providers, three on each side of the road, all about three or four inches away on the same bridge attachment. Um, that happens, as those are real world examples and I'm not pointing fingers, it's just the challenges we face uh, on that full ecosystem of uh, data centers, cloud compute, the network architecture and so on. Absolutely, no, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, you know, uh, to to that end, you know, taking it out beyond the, the plant in the field, but to the head end and the electronics and so on, all of those items that go into supporting it. Uh, to your point, uh, it, it takes a uh, it just takes a level of interrogation and otherwise that you know. Again, as I said, I just feel we we owe. Uh, to the end user at the end of the day to illuminate those potential points of failure, those common tie-in points, as you said. Um, I was fortunate enough in the past to have a CLEC business and, you know, we got uh, literally burned with a, uh, a fire at 401 North Broad Street in Philadelphia and exposed the fact that while we had four different ISP connections out to the world, you know, three of those were in one specific manhole. And, uh, you know, we had to ramp up our own efforts on the BCP front to make sure that never happened again. So, yeah, it's there's a lot more visibility into it uh, now. I would just wrap up by saying that, you know, the tools that are available to the service provider community um, in 2021, thankfully, far outweigh what what I had available to me when building that network 10 to 15 years ago. So, uh, but but great great feedback. Well said. No, it's, it's, you know, what what Warren and, and Ishak both alluded to, and I think they're great points is that we were at a point now in, in, in this fourth industrial revolution progression only uh, emphasized by, by COVID that um, if you don't realize that technology technology um, is not just part of your business, but is your business and your revenue stream, you need to reset at the board level and interrogate. I, I like that word, Warren. Interrogate your entire value chain and how you create product and services and look at where there could be potential weakness. Uh, and again, this is around recovery uh, and resilience and poke a lot of holes because uh, I don't think Colonial did to, to answer that question. Uh, they didn't run that red test, right? Uh, and, and look what happened. Um, we, we are firmly in the 21st century uh, data-centered economy, as I call it, and you better have enough generators and, a bunch, and enough redundant routes, and you better be um, doing all the things around your technical infrastructure 
that makes your revenue infrastructure works or uh, simply you'll you'll be out of business in a few years. Yeah. Hmm. What, what I would add to that is the <clears throat> enterprise customer has correctly stated on this panel has realized that technology is their business. That that includes hospitals. That includes banks. Everyone's using the Internet technology data transfer to kind of make themselves competitive, more agile and to compete in this marketplace. They, too, need to make it an initiative of focus in terms of security and privacy. So, for example, we work with DKICS and they've got this closed user group profile that allows even a small regional hospital, $10 billion hospital, to have a private peering relationship with its most trusted partners with a set of rules. And hospitals don't think to come to a facility and look for that. They've got to take the time and energy to start exploring what's available to make sure that I don't have what happened at Colonial happen to me, right? Because it could take me out of business. It could affect our economy. And those procurement teams that have been buried in the basement of the big corporate headquarters need to raise their hands and say, I had an answer for you, but you didn't listen to me three years ago. And they've got to make themselves much more relevant in the organization and start proposing ideas such as diverse routes, unique ways of interacting with others, creating technology to support their security, because it's the Wild West that we're going into in terms of the Internet is now critical. It's global. It's, it's accessible anywhere in the world. Our employees are, are remoting into our critical infrastructure. So how do we create these barriers? How do we protect ourselves? How do we do that tabletop blue sky planning to make sure that the, the what we never thought would ever happen does happen and then move mm. forward? You have to do a lot of planning. Procurement can no longer be a cost center. It should be a strategic initiative of how to do the best job you can buying what you need. I mean, it's, it's vital to the existence of the business at this point, really. Um, picking up on employees, and then I will only ask a couple more questions, and then we've got quite a few good questions um, on our audience Q&A um, side of the chat. Um, often, I mean, we've spoken about COVID, we've spoken about even hurricanes, big freezes, we've spoken about um, fires, but often the problem starts with uh, humans. Um, a lot of downtimes are human-made, let's say it that way. Um, how should businesses... This disaster recovery network resiliency plans account for potential staff wrongdoing. Um, who would like to take the lead on that one? That, that one's not an easy one because you're talking about your family in some cases, right? The folks that yeah. you work with every day and how to prepare. And it's about mm -hmm. having a process in place, creating a community of trusted employees that you know, that you work with. Uh, trust but verify, we call it. Um, doing background checks is very important. Uh, creating um, uh, organizations that work with each other, but check each other out at the same time too. And, and it goes beyond your employees because the industry is made up of technicians and vendors. We basically coordinate lots of vendors to create a product. And, and having those vendors also uh, show their commitment on them creating those background checks, making sure that they have a security process in place when they come to do work at our facilities or on the network. So it really is a collaborative effort of integrating your customers, your vendors, your partners to kind of agree is important for all of us and having those checks and balances in place. Because, you know, in the U.S., that is a concern at the moment, having insider threats. It's not the foreign adversaries. It's potentially insider threats on folks that aren't happy with the outcome of some event and trying to take, quote, unquote, a New York City building down by, uh, by by doing something nefarious and going into a manhole and, and the fire is not by accident. The fire was on purpose with a cast of gasoline. It caused quite a bit of damage in New York City. So it's about thinking through and about coordinating, planning and, 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 and collaborating with others. And I'd add, good point, Gil, I'd add to that, not a plug for Comstar by no means, but sometimes it takes a third party like Warren to come in and stress test all your code of conduct, how you run your administrative uh, logins, how you refresh them, all the rest of it. Be uh, and again, that that costs money, but uh, it can be uh, better than a pound of cure in, in many cases. Very well said. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think you know two, two key points, or you know, from my perspective, you know, are to empower and educate. So you know, get get the investment from your team, you know, empower them to influence positively, you know, what we're talking about here today and, and their own experience and the ownership that they, that they 
that they take on in terms of their the service to the client and they're providing that best in class experience, you know, and taking pride in that, uh, you know, personal brand and, and certainly the brand uh, element with the company itself. So Gil, to your point, you know, getting that investment is, is so key. Uh, I also think on the education front, you know, one of the things that we assist uh, companies do a, with doing is going through and, and uh, you know, providing examples, you know, whereby, you know, we'll, we'll put a, uh, you know, a, a spoof uh, email campaign together, for example, and see, again, how the staff responds. And the, the point being is it's not intended to be punitive, but it's intended to be educational. Uh, you know, doing a recap with staff uh, thereafter to, you know, again, illuminate why we have to avoid these things and what that impact could be to the business. Um, so in closing for me, those those are two key points and something we stress with our end users. All hmm. I think the, the email is quite interesting because sometimes it's the CEO that opens the email that they shouldn't, which has happened <laughs> a few years ago. Um, Isaac. Yeah, just just to um, you know add uh, uh, you know one point to that, uh, which is that the wrongdoing um, it does not have to be deliberate. Okay, mm. and it it um, at times may not even have anything to do with cyber security or physical security. You know, it can be just a lack of uh, training of how to use the system. Uh, you know, it can be an honest mistake by an employee. Um, it, from from my perspective and in my experience, at least, um, you know, the, the, the way to deal with it is to go beyond just uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, security uh, and and approach it as a proper comprehensive risk management task. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you have to and and the pandemic has has shown us that it's not even about enterprise risk management. It's now about integrated risk management. Uh, you know, that goes beyond your enterprise and even beyond your industry. Um, you know, it, uh, so it, it's having that high level comprehensive um, uh, approach, um, uh, you know, an adoption of that approach uh, that I think helps. Hmm. Now, that makes sense. Um, look, I was going to ask more questions, but we do have some really good questions on our Q&A um, from our audience. So let me start with that now. Uh, the first one is up to what extent uh, should governments be involved in regulating or assessing uh, vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure, so high concentration of cloud locations, connectivity paths, central offices. Um, I think that there, there is a big question. I mean, who wants to take the leads on that one? Who wants to talk about government? <laughs> so, so we, we have a pretty good relationship with our U.S. government, and, and we are open, and we actually invite them mm-hmm. to come in and do testing with us to make sure that we have the resilience we need and the security levels that we have. Uh, we're not afraid. But, but, but that invites regulation, right? And, and in our industry, data centers are not regulated, right? We, we position ourselves with certain accreditations. We share those accreditations out with our customers to make them feel comfortable. We go beyond the call of duty personally in doing this, but we do notice that a lot of carriers do not want to get into that space, right? Because historically, regulation means higher costs. Um, especially the larger providers get really disadvantaged in that case because they have a lot more to discover and a lot more to share. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. You know, what we do has become critical. The internet became critical overnight and it's not regulated, right? And how we do our connections is not regulated. I think the best way to do it is to partner, to partner, show a plan, show commitment and market your resilience as an operator to demonstrate that you've got some resilience in your network that you're not one building away or two buildings away from having a catastrophic failure and taking down an entire region. Um, I think with the new public-private partnerships, I know our government has, has earmarked dollars in the billions for critical infrastructure. It's open to talking to the carrier community. Um, we invite the carrier community to you know, engage and, and at least start having the conversations with them. Hmm. Yes, and we also don't want a lot of bureaucracy coming in uh, and starting curbing the, the, the innovation within the sector. Um, Isaac? Yeah, so uh, as a Canadian on the panel, I'm going to be the proponent for government regulation. Uh, <laughs> you know, as, I, um, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, 
when we are the, the introduction of technology into um, existing uh, industrial systems and existing infrastructure uh, uh, does come with some risk. Um, and I know uh, that uh, regulation at times can impede innovation um, and even economic development, um, you know, but uh, societies should strive to achieve a balance between the two because you know as i mentioned earlier if you leave the a, a power system company to coordinate uh, with the communication service provider in the region to understand the interdependencies that are being created uh, you know when they uh, develop a, a system a, a smart grid system that leverages the communication infrastructure and integrates the two infrastructure you know, uh, without any government support and regulation and, and a push by the rest of the society, uh, you know, th that's too big of a risk to take to leave it to, you know, just to private organizations like that, in my opinion, you know, a, and, and I'll be honest, that's an opinion, uh, you know, from my perspective, the interdependencies between we are, uh, uh, that we are creating between different systems uh, span multiple industries, uh, you know, they go across all these industries and, and you need some kind of oversight uh, to make sure that the risk introduced is being managed, is, is managed. And that's where the government oversight and regulations come in and it has a role to play. Uh, yes, it has to be balanced, no doubt. Uh, you know, we're not in an authoritarian uh, regime, at least here in, in, in North America, um, um, you know, but there is a role to play for regulations. Hmm. Sean? As an example, um, uh, Kohler works hand in hand with, with the EPA in, in the US. So they define a standard on emissions levels. Uh, it's called the EPA tier four final standard. And so we manufacture products to that standard. Um, they don't tell us how to do it or, or, or what to do, just a threshold to hit. And that works well for us for mitigating emissions on generators. So that's a, a partnership um, model that doesn't necessarily stifle innovation or add uh, extra regulation. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got one, it's time for one more question. So when running a data center, what percentage of the consumption goes to running the machines and how much for cooling rooms, for the cooling rooms, sorry. Um, who wants to take that one? Maybe Sean. Ooh, that's a, that's a consultant answer, depends, right? Um, yeah. so, <laughs> Uh, years ago, uh, Christian Bellotti, who's now at Microsoft, kind of mm. authored this this measurement of of that very thing called PUE, PUE and it's it's really a uh, an effectiveness uh, or efficiency of how you use power in a facility, right? Um, where the most perfect and unobtainable efficiency level is is 1.0. Every kilowatt or megawatt you you have coming into the facility is used for your IT critical load. Um, so it's it's been a bit of a, a bit of a battle at the hyperscale level over the years. Who can get that number the lowest? Um, currently, kind of best in in practice in the industry is is 1.1, uh, which is really close to 1.0. So lots of different things go into that, including what you measure in that number and how you do your cooling. Do you use a, a chiller based system? Do you use free air um, economization? Um, how do you return power to your IT critical load? Very, very um, uh, deep question with lots of different answers, and we could spend a whole hour on that. But that is tracked, and it's a bit of a competitive thing with, with data centers. Yeah. The enterprise data centers, uh, because of uh, the age of the gear and, and the fact that they're sometimes hosted in office buildings, have much, much higher numbers than some of the very large scale data center, scale data center providers. Uh, so they can operate much more efficiently, dry their OPEX down, so on and so forth. And that explains some of this, you know, kind of flight to cloud and, and, and movement to co-location managed services and, and cloud service providers over the last few years. I'd like, I'd like to add one too. There's a customer we have called Bulk. And in Norway, it just stopped snowing last week. And they've got free cooling most of the year. Uh, they also have water falling constantly, so they're all on hydropower. So they have zero emissions, um, all renewable energy. Um, they've really mastered this. If you want to try and save the planet, let your compute happen in Norway. And they have a cable that goes from our building to Norway. And they invite those to put in hyperscale facilities. There are parts of Norway, they will pay you to take the electricity off their hands. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Bulk has one of those properties, but sure. Northern Norway, they have too much power. They have had to take it off the system. 
Yeah. So yeah. I think your geography matters when you want to try and get a good PUE and get a good uh, renewable energy program. Yeah, especially yeah. especially north of Norway, um, it's full of energy in those places. I mean, we saw the Colos, Colos data center, which maybe didn't go as planned, but it, it's that country is full of energy. There's no lack of energy there. Uh, but look, guys, um, I'm afraid that's all the time that we have for. Um, I really appreciate you taking time to join us today. Um, and on behalf of the panelists, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in and for participating in today's roundtable. Uh, just a quick reminder that our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour uh, to answer any more of your questions, and there's a few more. Uh, so meet them back in the networking lounge at the table. Um, and to our viewers as well, if you were one of the first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one, which takes place on July the 15th, where leaders in our industry will talk about edge data centers, critical low latency solutions for big cities. For me, that's a wrap. And look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge and happy networking.